Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 223, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Mr. Seth Abel Robinson, the creator of Legend of the Red Dragon and Dink Smallwood. This part of the interview, we will talk finally about Dink Smallwood. I know you guys have been waiting for that. Then we'll talk about some of his later games, including uh, Teenage Lawnmower, Funeral Quest, and a little thing called Varmint Hunter that he really didn't want me to mention. Anyway, a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Seth Robinson. All right, so in 1997, we get Dink Smallwood, and uh, I know you said yesterday you kind of broke your heart that I didn't have it, so I went ahead and got it for the... I was playing, just playing it on the Android. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, I was just giving you a hard time, but because you're, you're really... You're an RPG master, and to have you go... Dink Smallwood, I may have heard of that <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it hurts, but you don't forget it, a game that you get lets you punch so many chickens. You know. Oh yeah, ducks. yeah. <laughs> ducks, the classic uh, punching the heads off ducks with true rotating sprites of the head flying is the best thing about the game. So, what's the story behind Dink Smallwood? Uh, I met. This is, um, besides Grotopia, this is the only other game I think that I ever collaborated with someone else on in, in a big way. I mean, I always had people coming over and help me with stuff. Um, but Justin Martin was the artist for Dink Smallwood, and I met him. Uh, he lived in my town, and our parents were friends. And I, for some reason, I went into his room and he wasn't there. I, you know, I'd never met him, but I saw his room and he had a Neo Geo. And in those days, man, that was amazing. I'd never even seen a Neo Geo home system before. Um, they're, they're very expensive and the games cost like 200 bucks a pop in those days. And he, he had written, he'd drawn these gorgeous things all over his walls, like Little Mermaid and things. I don't really know why, but... Uh, yeah, he's an incredible artist. So I, uh, we got together, and I made him. I mean, I didn't make him, but I asked him to do a Lord poster for me, because uh, Lord had was doing great. And um, just to go back a little bit, I had ported Lord to World Group, which is a, a special kind of super BBS that could handle hundreds of nodes, hundreds or only sixteen. I don't know. At the same time. And each version of Lord that I sold on this system was 300 bucks a pop. The whole economics of it were a whole different level from the classic BBS systems. And they were run by businesses. So I made, uh, I would give 20 posters and sign some of them if you bought Lord. Because if you, you know, if you drop $300 on a door game, uh, you should get something. And these posters were were made to give uh, to players in tournaments. So Justin designed the poster. And uh, if Matt edits it good later, there it is. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, it's so low res. I couldn't find a good one. And uh, after that, I said, wow, you're, you know, you're pretty good. Let's make a RPG. Because I, I always wanted to. I, I played a lot of Bard's Tale 3 on the 64. I played every RPG that I could find. And so we did it. Uh, it took about a year and a half, I guess, to make one little RPG. I learned my lesson. They, you don't make RPGs fast. Not possible. It was a long journey and uh, a lot of fun. So how did so, it do as far as sales are concerned? I mean, I looked at some of the contemporary reviews. They seem pretty positive, uh, but mostly about the humor. It seemed like everybody thought the game was just you know, rip-roaringly hilarious. Yeah, I, I, I can look back on it now honestly and say the, the, the fighting is way too simplistic, the hit detection is questionable. The, uh, part of the problem was Justin drew the graphics before I really had the engine going. And later I said, oh, wait, these are all isometric. Everything is drawn from an angle like this. I was going to do rectangle collision. I don't know how to do this, you know, Ultima style walking north is actually diagonal thing. My programming skills, I don't know what I'm doing, Justin. So I, I made it work anyway with bad collision. And 
so I, I think the game itself, mm, yeah, it's it's too hard in some areas, too easy in some. It's not balanced the best, but the writing was good as far as different from other RPGs. A lot of weird references. Um, there's a an example is there's a building that is a cabinet shop with my family in it my real family larry and my sister promise oh yeah my sister's name is promise makes sense right and my name is seth makes sense when you know my parents so you could talk to my sister and my dad and there's no reason for this they're not part of the quest at all you couldn't punch them though you could yeah and uh (laughs) i don't think you'd kill them but my sister would would act spoiled and i would just so the writing was uh interesting and yeah i think funny and a lot of spelling errors and stuff which has since been fixed by uh other people thank goodness but um what was the question uh, let's see the writing was okay what was good about dink uh yeah i guess only the only the right oh yeah sales sales uh were okay i would say um it was published in Europe by Iridon Interactive, and I actually can show you the box. It's the wow. last one that I have, so you can kind of see it has some screenshots. And they they sent me a couple of royalty checks. It's a pretty pretty good sized box there too. What, what's, yeah. what's inside there? You got some uh, uh yeah trinkets well, or goodies or anything? I, I don't want to break the shrink wrap. This is my only... <laughs> <laughs> this, this is kind of dusty, but... Oh, it's amazing what's in here. If Fall only map. I could show you. Yeah, no, well, I think it, it does have a manual, but that's about it. Not much. I didn't make a lot from them, though. They... I, I don't... How can I put this? Maybe they have some questionable accounting practices, and also, I don't think it sold that well. But they went out of business or actually rebranded themselves and they didn't pay me the last part that they owed me. I never got it. I remember them saying, you need to send in a purchase order in the correct format. And I was like, what? Just send me my royalties. I don't know what that is. I don't know what you're talking about. I never did that before. So most of the money I made, I I sold directly from my uh, BBS and website, I guess at that time, websites were a thing. And it did okay. Um, me and Just- Justin and I did not get rich or anything, but it was it was okay. Lord paid for the development of Dink, and Dink paid for the development of whatever the next thing was that I worked on. So I didn't get rich or anything. See, you should have put some rats in it. I know, I know. Um, after watching Matt Chat, I realized that the secret mm. of success is the rat yeah, quest. You got to get that rat right off the bat. And a duck quest just doesn't <laughs> uh, have the same. I don't know. That's why. I know. Yeah. I do. I do love the ducks, though. That that was that's that was nice. Uh, now you also had sort of a do do it yourself kit with this game too, right? I think they're called D mods. Right. Right. Um, so there's a I, lot of interest learned, in doing those. Yeah, I learned from Lord that that could uh, extend the life of the product, and I, I to make a game replayable with Lord, you could kind of replay it over and over because you would reset when you won the game, you killed the dragon, and you would keep some of your stats. So you had a reason to kind of keep going uh, a ranking, but an RPG. Eh, you you win it, you're done. So these these add-on modules did help a lot, and even today, I think people are still making them. I think there's more. There are more than 300 add-ons made for Dink, and they're they're separate quests. And you you said you got the Android version. It has a built-in uh, DMOD um, downloader. So if you know the link, the URL, you just put in the DMOD, and it pops up right there and you can click and play it instantly. It's a pretty nice system, nice setup. That was, I thought it was kind of remarkable. One of the things that I liked so much about playing Lord was, you know, as strange as, as it sounds, having that sort of narrow time limit, you know, you can only do so many things per day. You know, it's maybe, what, 10, 15 minutes a day probably to play that. There's yep. something kind of compelling about that, and you, you never feel like you've played it enough. 
like, okay, I'm going to have to come back tomorrow and play some more because you don't, you don't ever feel that sort of satisfied. But I noticed when I was looking at the reviews of the of Dink on the Android and their, what was it, Google Store, Google Play Store, people were saying the same sort of thing about that game. Like, this is the perfect RPG for just playing in small doses, like when you're you know, waiting in line or something like that. I was just wondering, uh, you think some of your... Uh, some of your gameplay or developer style, design style, carried over into that game from Lord. Hmm. I, I think. I think originally no, because of the save point system, you really couldn't. You, but I know that on the HD version, the Android version, I added instant saving from anywhere, and I think that's why they can say that now. Because before you would just you would be screwed if you had to quit early, but I think because of the if you just uh, flip to a different app and come back, it does save and load for you. So now it works really well for that. Uh, the gameplay, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess not. Didn't really do that on purpose. Uh, if we talk about funeral quest, though, that's where I did do that on purpose. When I don't want to jump ahead if you're gonna, if you were going <laughs> to ask about that. Uh, so just a few last things about uh, Dink. Uh, so in 1999, you made it for, available for free? Right. The sales had had slowed down. Um, it turns out it is, was not going to be a blockbuster. And I kind of I felt like, eh, I made enough money on it. Fair enough. Let's make it free. And then Electronic Arts picked it up. and Right, right. <laughs> it became a huge hit. I. <laughs> I actually did shop it around a, a little bit, um, not to Electronic Arts, but another big company looked at it, and they told me, we're thinking about it. Uh, this is before I released it. And they said, you know, we'll, we'll ask for some changes, and I'll think about this. And later I found out all they had done is shopped it out again to other companies and said, how much will you pay for this? Will you, to like, I don't know. So it's kind of a dirty, weird, that's a, the publishing industry. They never owned it, and they were already making deals to sell it to someone else just to see if they wanted to buy it and sell it again, like that kind of. So I, I showed it to someone else, and I go, oh, we've already seen this. This other company showed it to us. Why? I never, they don't have permission to do that. So I'm really happy that I'm indie, and, and I, it's been a, on a side note, it's, it's been a conscious decision not to, try to get on even Xbox or PS3 or I just don't want to deal with it. iOS is enough, hard enough to get on to have to deal with waiting a week to get approved on that. I, after all the horror stories I've read from other developers, last thing I want to do is deal with publishers and finicky platforms that take months of red tape. Life is too short. So unless I had to, then I would do it You know, for money. How's the HD version doing, by the way? Uh, it's doing okay. The original artist, Justin, came back and helped me with uh, new interface graphics for the touch interface and the new menus. And um, we've, we've made a, a couple of bucks. I would say it's doing... Uh, it, it did all right. I think it's made like 30, 40 grand. Not, you know, enough. Enough to pay for the time to port it to those systems. Yeah, I'm kind of a new a newbie when it comes to Android, but I did notice in the game options there were lots of different controller sort of uh, options there. So I guess there's some kind of gamepad you can get to play it with or Yeah, yeah, we I support a lot of uh, a lot of those. Is there a Android. particular way that you'd recommend that we play it? Uh yeah, with um ah uh, geez. I forgot the name of the gamepad, but it's a supported gamepad. And I have a version that supports the new Moga gamepad, or it's old now maybe, which I put in like a year ago, but I never released it. Because not even one person asked me who, you know, please put support for the Moga gamepad. Moga is this really nice uh, wireless Bluetooth gamepad for Android. A good idea. It makes sense. So if, you, if anyone out there has a Moga gamepad and you actually want this, let me know because I'm too lazy to release it if not even one person asks. But I do support another gamepad, I think, and also the suction cup joystick that you stick onto your screen and push around. And it, it works surprisingly well. 
it feels like a real joystick because you know tactile feed feedback on your finger the way you can push it are you going to release it for ouya uh i don't think they want freeware and i don't think they allow um non freemium do they or you have to have a demo or i i don't actually know maybe yeah sure i guess yeah what is it i think the demo you have to have a demo but you can charge for it or all right yeah see i never I did a, a demo <laughs> i don't have an ouya yet <laughs> uh yeah well i word it's on the street just, is it's probably just hopelessly innovative or something i don't know yeah word on the street is you're not going to make your money back or your time so i don't mm, i'm sorry to say i like the idea but it would be for it would be a release I do for fun, I think. Sorry. Did you do to, to we owners? A funeral quest before teenage lawnmower. Or what's the order on those? Y yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I did funeral quest. Um, to explain, funeral quest was my idea of making a BBS game for the internet. B BBSs were over. I sold all of my BBS games to another company. I was done with them. I'd been supporting them for like seven years. I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm finished. They don't make much money. That must all have been I do, heartbreaking for you when the internet started to take off and well, I guess muds and things like that took over, right? A piece of me died that day. No, well, a, a little bit. I, I was sad about parts, but I was also really excited about the internet. It... Um, it turns out it was a big deal. I, I love, I, I loved the possibilities that I imagined. So I said, okay, no big deal. I'll just make my games for the internet. Same exact system, same idea. I'll have uh, turns per day, and it will be free for the users to play. No, you can't really charge individual users. It's just like BBSs, and the operator, the game operator, will pay for it. So that was my big idea, and Funeral Quest was the game. <laughs> and, funeral quest. <laughs> you know, I think I mean, the the uh, subjects. Yeah. So if you don't know the game, it lets you run a funeral parlor, right? That's the right. It's the a it. I mean. multiplayer. It has a flash client, <laughs> and <laughs> you, you really that to somebody. <laughs> all two hundred real players are all running funeral parlors against each other, and sabotaging each other. And you do deal with customers, and you guilt them or. You know, you use psychological tricks on them. It completely different than any other fighting system, I think, in the history of games. And did it has its fans, but I could see pretty early on that there's no way this is ever going to be a thing. Funeral Quest is not for everybody, and that's okay. That's all right. I don't know, how and, can you resist a game called Funeral Quest? I mean, you yeah, at least, exactly. You have to at least check what check it out. You know, I I took I took it down um, a month ago because my the system died, and I no longer give licenses. It was too much hassle to what I was doing is licensing people to run their own games. But I'll bring it back someday. But right now it's unplayable, and the worst part is. I couldn't find even one YouTube movie of someone playing it. It's so cool, really. I, I want people to see that, but there's no documentation of it out there. Of a few screenshots. Gonna, I just have to show this this text with the, like footage not available. Yeah, this yeah. <laughs> it it had sound, music. Uh, there's even animations. When a girl comes in and sad, you see a tear go down her face. It. Uh, my wife did all the artwork for that game, and it has this weird. I don't know the style. I really liked it. Funeral Quest. You should, you should put. A, you should bring it back. You know, I'm very curious. I maybe I will try to run, you know, one last big game or just it's the only place, just one game, and see if I could get enough users. Last time I ran it, I only had like t 30 daily players. So I don't know. Maybe if we can get the word out, play Funeral Quest. Maybe it's free. Died, just maybe they all died it. off. I don't. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. All right, so what about this Teenage Lawnmower game? You know, that, that's gotten some attention for you. I noticed that you were the finals, or got to the finals of the Independent Games Festival back in 2003 with that. Right, right. I think in 2003, pretty much anybody could get in to the, <laughs> to the IGF uh, who, who had, you know, 
fancy 3D graphics. And in those days, that was a, a thing uh, that set you apart. The truth is, I was trying to make an RPG, a new RPG. I was like, okay, I did Dink, but now it's time to go to the next level. Now I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do... A uh, lawn mowing game. <laughs> right, well, <laughs> I, I found out that making an RPG is really hard, and I didn't learn from Dink how to do it faster or anything. So yeah, I said, okay, I got an idea. I'll do an interim game mm-hmm. to test the engine. Well, just, you know, step by step. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So at least, yeah, at least I got out one game with that engine before I trashed it and got bored, went to the next engine. That's what happens when you're a programmer. You do half, you do some work and you move on and you go, oh, this is all crap. Uh, I, I'm going to start again. That's a great idea. Over and over. So I've written like 10 engines. And if I'm lucky, I get something like Teenage Lawnmower out the door before I move on. So the guys at the festival, do they think that the Teenage Lawnmower thing was this sort of profound you know, abstract art, artistic it, kind of statement. It or must, yeah, that, that's the only <laughs> explanation I have. Um, I, in, it's one of the only games it's where so you, postmodern. you find like pregnancy tests in the garbage of your mother. And you're like, oh, my mom's pregnant. And she, your dad is abusive or, you know, her boyfriend is abusive. I, I don't know why, but it, I mean, I do know why. The mechanics were not enough. So I had to put on this layer of story and narrative to make it more interesting. So you had a reason to mow your heart out and, and compete in these, uh, the arcade sequences. So I, maybe because of that, the subject matter, which, which was strangely adults, thinking of the, you know, when you look at the game, it doesn't make sense. You're like, why is that in, in that? How, why am I making these choices? Halfway through Teenage Lawnmower, uh, there's actually, you play D&D with your friend. Um, and you can, there's a whole mini game of kind of Lord-like where you, you choose to attack or run and you eventually get in a fight with your friend. None of it makes sense now that I think about it. Uh, it didn't do that well, really, su- surprisingly. I mean, it just sort of screams cult <laughs> classic. It, it was strange. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to go to, GDC and, and be in the IGF anyway. All right, so I think we're up to Dungeon Scroll now. And I like the description you had for this game on your website a lot. If a word game and a dungeon crawler had a baby, <laughs> this would be right. <laughs> so that's yeah. What, yeah, for spelling, right? Is it edu- yeah, it's edutainment, a, I guess you'd call it's, it. It's a word game. I, I, I do... I work on a lot of different kinds of games because uh, I get bored with the same thing. And I was really into word games myself at that time. I was playing games like Text Twist and Bookworm. And yeah, Bookworm. So, yeah, so I said, oh, can I do a game like that? But the worst thing you can do is clone a game. Never. I'm going to make my change to it. I'm going to add my special sauce uh, to it. So that was the kind of the medieval theme with the dungeon crawling aspect, which really is a time limit of having to get words and words are magic spells. And the longer the word you hit the monster. Uh, and yeah, strangely, uh, that also was an IGF finalist, um, for some reason. And it was a good game. I mean, it is a good game. I, I talk like everything is gone, but this is the internet. Those games are all available on uh, mobile now. I ported them. So no, it's good. It was, it was good. And, for a word game, if you're into word games, and I guess uh, dungeon crawling. I noticed you did some other phone or mobile conversions, uh, Duke Nukem, uh, for the Tapwave Zodiac, you know, of all. Oh yeah, you still yeah. Have a, a Tapwave Zodiac there somewhere. I I do I do it won't it won't like boot up, but I do have one. It was a nice piece of hardware. Yeah. Even though. Um, I was able to work at home and from my, you know, bedroom uh, pretty my whole programming career, I guess. After putting out games like Teenage Lawnmower and Funeral Quest, uh, I couldn't pay the bills. So uh, what do you do? Well, you do contract work for other people. And I did port games um, like Duke Nukem and, and things to kind of pay the bills. And I worked on some 
Duke Nukem 3D, the original, is, is a great game. I'm happy to be associated with that. But some of the games I worked on, oh my lord, I did not. I sent you a, <laughs> some screenshots, but I did not include any for Varmit Hunter. So I hope you don't <laughs> find that shot. And I mean, these games were so bad that I just, I don't want to tell anyone about it. So erase that whole part. But uh, horrible games. Varmit but you, Hunter. You, you do what you have to do, right, to survive. So I would do some contract work, and then I would say, uh, okay, I, I really charged a lot. And I would say, okay, now I can work on my own stuff for a while and go back and forth. And I think a lot of indies uh, do that or have to or forced to sometimes. Okay, let's see. Tanked. There we go. Right. This now, must be, is this your most recent or is Grotopia? Uh, Grotopia is. Grotopia. Grotopia so is. Tanked is before that, then. Tanked is a 3D multiplayer, real-time multiplayer tank combat game on mobile. I had done some mobile games, and I, I kind of came to the realization that if you're going to do any game, you need to, do, you need to spend an extra, uh, extra time on it and make it special because you know there's 3 billion apps out there. You need to set yourself apart. It's not enough to make a game as good as another game. You've got to do something different. And freemium, free to jump in and instantly play and shoot another tank in 3D seemed like a good idea a few years ago. And it, it kind of did okay. Uh, it's still running now, and there are some fans. But the monetization scheme, I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, it doesn't really work that well. I didn't make much money on it. I mean, I guess I did a little. Paid the bills. But it laid the groundwork for the next game. So I could I learned a ton about multiplayer uh, gameplay and running writing the server that runs on on uh, Linux and or Unix, I guess. Uh, let me let me see. And then I was able to to steal all that code from Tanked and use it on new games. And so I'm, Tanked is good, I'm, especially because of that reason. You know, I, I guess so, to kind of continue with this theme of doing all the tools for people so they can play the game, but if they want to make their own modules and things, they could do that. Uh, you've also developed some complete game creation systems. I was looking at one called Nova Shell uh, from 2006. Nova Shell is the engine for another failed to materialize RPG that I was working on. After the 3D one, I, I said, okay, I'm going to go back to 2D because, hey, gameplay is what's important, not 3D. It's better if I can um, be a little less ambitious visually. And instead, I'm going to put all my effort into pathfinding and gameplay. Everything Dink was missing. So... I started working on it, and the engine was called Nova Shell. And the engine was um, used Lua scripting and, and very powerful. But I kind of I pooped out, and I never made the RPG. And if you download Nova Shell, you can play uh, an RPG, mm, the RPG in progress that I was working on, and with with uh, like free artwork that I found, or even there's one version of Dink artwork done. And yeah, I just released it um, out there for free for anyone who wants. And a few people made games with it. Um, not, not popular or anything, but a, a great learning experience. And then after that, yeah, I did write a new, uh, less, a little bit lower level framework called Proton. And that's the one that all of my mobile games uh, are based on. So where Nova Shell is more of an engine, game engine, Proton is, is a little lower level. And it actually is running uh, Duke, Duke Nukem 3D on the on Android and iOS, for instance. It's just abstracts all the input and graphics and things so that you don't have to worry about it. But I, I kind of I'm tired of that now too. So I'm quitting, I'm quitting that. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna learn Unity or something. I'm just I'm too tired of fighting with engines. No more engines, no more wasting time. Well, you do seem to have a passion. You know, sort of the truest indie a sense of wanting to help other people develop uh, games and you know develop their game ideas. 
You even have a blog called CodeDojo.com. Is that? Right? Yeah, yeah. You can download. Yeah. Now, lots of behind source code. You know all the behind the scenes stuff you'd want. Well, you know maybe the you know you call it horrible source code, but I sometimes wonder if maybe looking at something like that, that could be really helpful for somebody trying to learn coding. Because if all you see is like the slick, you know. Yeah, super yeah. Super polished stuff all the time. I mean. That's true. You can learn what not to do. And, and a lot of times bad source code is bad because it's simple and easy to understand. So as a stepping stone, maybe that's good. And uh, I do, I am, I am part of uh, the Ludum Dare community, if, if you've heard of that. And that's a great place too for any aspiring uh, developers out there. What's it, what's it called again? Uh, Ludumdare.com. It's a 48-hour competition. Some people call it Ludum Dare, who want to be fancy and, and Latin. But you, it's very popular. Three times a year, they have a competition. And in two days, they, everyone makes like 2,000 games. And then they rate them. And anyone who submitted a game can rate, it, rate games. And there's a, they pick a winner. So it's just fun to make something. And I've, I've made like eight games or something through that. So helping, sharing and helping is something that everyone should do who, who can because uh, I, I got so much help over the years. Uh, even on Lord, people would help me with the complex fossil driver and modem port stuff that I, I had no idea what I was doing. So if you've got an idea, you can find, you know, you should be able to find someone to help you implement it. Okay, so I just have a couple of last questions. A couple of last questions for you. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, just coming back to these aspiring coders. So somebody that's, you know, you said you started this back when you were what, 14, 15. So kind of put yourself back. Say there's a 14, 15 year old out there right now that wants to follow in your footsteps. You know, what would you? Uh, how would this person get started nowadays? Well. After 24 years of, of doing it, um, I think if, if I've learned anything, Lord, my first crappy text game is probably my most popular, one of my most popular games and took no mm, technical skill. So, and yet, Later, you know, I, I had a lot more skill doing 3D games that did worse. So I think what you should take away is the idea is more important than the tools. Focus on your idea, what you want to do. You know, don't get too crazy to start. But realize that you're not limited um, just because you are not the best coder with the, today's tools, Unity and stuff. Spend all your extra time on your idea, not not on just the the hard you know the hardcore coding stuff uh, there are lots of brilliant simple ideas yet to be discovered and don't and go for it cuz uh that's my experience yeah, I saw one of your blog posts where you're talking about how the an rpg is always a fun project to start but then after about 10% <laughs> you know after it's about 10% done it just becomes this huge slog right yeah yeah without a question you got to build your way up to that. Uh, you have to, you almost have to be 14 and naive to start one, but you might finish it too. If you're too, if you're too smart about this stuff, you're going to be one of those business guys who go, all right, we're going to make the match three on the iPhone and we're going to do this and we're going to reskin it eight times and release six versions of it in the next three. And you're going to make crap, you know? So you kind of need to be a little naive and take on the big one and take the chance because Dink, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And even though it's not perfect, I'm proud that I got it done. And knowing what I know now, I would not even start Dink, but I'm, I'm sure glad I did. So, so be naive and jump in and just do it, I say. I'll give the worst, worst advice ever, <laughs> the opposite advice of everyone else. Yeah, just go for it. Try, well, especially while you live at home, though. So last question I have for you. I saw on the, your page you had this uh, part about a little page set aside for math. And, you know, you're talking about ways to learn math. And I guess, you know, that seems to be something that scares off a lot of people that probably would, you know, love to get into programming and, and game development. But they're 
kind of scared off by the math a part of it. So do you have any advice for those people? Ding Smallwood was made with zero math skill. And like I say on that page, I didn't use even floating point math even once. No, no decimals, uh, just round numbers only. And I can't believe the timing. That, well, that's why the timing in fighting is so bad. And uh, looking back, I wish I knew that stuff. But it shows that it's possible to do stuff without knowing uh, too much about it. If you're a kid in school, okay, fine, learn the math, but you you can make what you want to make, uh, if even if you're not an expert with it. But you might as well learn it. I I did pick up some later, and it has helped. All right. Well, is there any anything else that we didn't discuss, didn't talk about, or anything you want to plug? Uh, um, I just want to say hey to Cosmo, my son, and sorry you couldn't be on Matt Chat. Eat it. He's a huge fan, <laughs> and he wanted to be on, but he, uh, he'd probably be dancing around in the background, but he's at school, so we're very lucky oh. he couldn't be here. <laughs> That's too bad. He'd, yeah, I know. He'd moon us, and who knows what he would do, so it's for oh. the best. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. I should be back in two weeks. Uh, the semester is starting here next week, so I'll probably need all of my time to prepare for that. But uh, fear not, my plan is to be back in two weeks with a new retrospective. And as always, guys, if you have suggestions for games you want to see on the show, just pop over to uh, the Match Hat forums or just mention it here in the YouTube comments. All right. Uh, oh, almost forgot. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone who has uh, donated and supported this show. Uh, it seems like folks get especially uh, generous around Christmas time, so thank you very, very much for that, guys. It really means a, a lot to me. You're keeping this show on the air. If you want to uh, make a donation, just pop over to those uh, mattchat.us uh, uh, website. Look for the Support the Show link. It's very easy. You can set up a subscription in about five seconds. Thank you very, very much. All right, what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, funny you should ask. I've got a Ovila Belgian-style Abbey Season. It looks like Saison. It's probably, <laughs> probably butchering the pronunciation of that. But anyway, this is a special brew from the Sierra Nevada uh, Brewery, one of my favorite companies. They're out of uh, uh, Chico, uh, California. Uh, but anyway, they have a you know a lot of great beers. You probably tried them before, uh, but this one is Belgian style, and it's brewed with mandarin oranges and peppercorns. And apparently, uh, the only real connection they have to Abbey, um, the monks anyway, is that the monks picked some of the oranges. And some of those mandarin oranges have ended up in this, so kind of have to read between the lines to make sure this isn't, in fact, an Abbey ale. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, chances are good this is going to be really delicious. So uh, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so this is one of those that has the fun top on it. So let's see if I can do a little damage here. So you unscrew this. Yeah, this is a good, you know, all beers should be like this. It would prevent alcoholism, right? If you're too drunk to get this off, you don't need to be drinking the beer. All right, that's off. Now let's see if I can aim this right at you. You uh, really should be staring right at the cork, right at it, you know, as you do this. But uh, just for demonstration purposes, we'll do it a little bit differently. Here we go. Ready? <laughs> oh, uh, come on. Well, it's really wedged in there. Good. Oh, oh well. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm here with some of this Ovila Ale, Belgian Ale. Ah, smelling this smells really good. It definitely has that Belgian uh, like scent to it. It's kind of hard to describe it if you haven't had one, but I it seems kind of citrusy, very citrusy, peachy kind of flavor. Uh, also, they said they put mandarin oranges in here, and I can definitely confirm that. I don't smell the peppercorns, but maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but it's 7.5 uh, percent alcohol, which is definitely on up there. I think a Budweiser has something like 5 percent, 4.7, something like that, but. Anyway, smell-wise, it smells really good. Uh, let's give it a taste. I don't care about that. Listen. <sighs> Very citrusy. Um, almost like a... Uh, what is that flavor? Almost kind of a pineapple-like flavor to this. A very sweet, a very uh, citrusy, 
nice and thick too. I don't really taste a lot of the alcohol. Uh, you do taste the sort of mandarin oranges in there. Definitely some uh, good mandarin flavor there, but it doesn't overpower uh, the beer. Let me try it again. You know what I think? Yeah, really good stuff here. It's sort of a, a lot of those, uh, the citrus kind of is what you really taste here. A lot of a citrus, citric acid, I guess, sort of a flavor. Um, a lot of orange, a lot of peach. Um, maybe just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a clove-like taste to it. I don't get the uh, peppercorns at all. Let me try one more time to search for those peppercorns. They stab, then bite. No, I'm just not getting any kind of peppery taste with this. Uh, but it is very, very good. I'm going to go uh, out on the limb here and give this one a full 5 out of 5 drinking horns. A really extraordinary flavor. I like the mandarin oranges. I was a little bit worried that they would, you know, put too many in there and kind of overpower it. But it uh, actually doesn't work like that at all. Just a very, you know, complements the other flavors very well. Uh, so 5 out of 5 drinking horns. If you can get this um, Ovila uh, Abbey Saison Season uh, from Sierra Nevada, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, good stuff. Anyway, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. So the quotation for this week comes from the great author John Steinbeck, and it goes something like this. Man is the only kind of varmint who sets his own trap, baits it, and then steps in it. See you guys next week. It's the work of a genius, an expert in time distortion. A time traveler, maybe. And an ingenious operator. Well, then we must get back to the TARDIS, Doctor. Well, that's the other side of the river, I think. You know, we seem to be flitting around in some sort of 20-year time loop. <laughs>